Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Daniel Serra. I'm the director of ecosystem and stakeholders at EA Tuba Mobility. Today, we, we have an amazing panel about the um, use cases for mobility data spaces in European cities. And for, but first, I will introduce to Judy Domara, that is our head of Innovation Hub Central, that will introduce EUTUBE Mobility. And then we will continue with the, with the moderate, I will continue with the moderation of the panel, and we will explain more about data spaces. Thank you, Judith. You can come to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my role to set the context of what EIT Urban Mobility is about, and I will do this pretty quickly, not to take too much time away from the panel. So, EIT, Urban Mobility, who are we, what do we do, and why do we do it? We do many activities, um, but in essence, we seed and we spur and we speed up innovations in the field of urban mobility. And why are we doing this? We do this because time is pressing. If we take the goals of the European Green Deal seriously, we need to change our way we move ourselves and our goods around the cities fundamentally in only seven years. Transport, and above all, road transport is responsible for a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions. And to meet these targets, we've set ourselves with the European Green Deal, we need to cut 55% of these emissions by 2030 and 90% by 2050. And this is compared to 1992 levels. But not only have we failed miserably to reduce these emissions related to transport, we have increased them by 2% every year since the year 2000. And much of this transport is happening in cities. And this is, for us, the key. For the mobility transitions, cities are the pioneers and they are the drivers of innovation and of change. Over three quarters of the EU's population live in cities, and cities are the origin, the destination, and also the for a large part of, of our traffic, and therefore cities are instrumental for this change, but they also need the support of innovative partners. So how do we, as EIT uh, Mobility, contribute to this? We have four main activities. First one, innovation. Innovation for us is really taking innovation to the markets. So we bring together private companies, startups, research institutes, and work together to implement pilots in cities. And this way, solutions are tested in real life. And this testing and implementation in cities speeds up market uptake and scaling. So we, with our monies, we fund market-ready or close-to-market solutions in the cities. Second key activity we do is training and skills. We believe that entrepreneurial spirit is essential to spur innovation. We bring talent to business. So we offer higher education degrees to boost the number of graduates with this proper mindset. But we also empower those working as mobility practitioners already in the cities with new skill sets and knowledge. Third, we bring startups to scale. So to shape the mobility transformation effectively and quickly, it takes courage and the willingness to take risks. And this is to work together also with young and innovative companies. 
So this is why we at EIT Urban Mobility, we have been supporting over 200 of the leading mobility startups from all over Europe since uh, the year 2020. And we focus exclusively on the teams that create sustainable added value, what we call impact. And then this, of course, in addition um, to a successful business model. And then we connect and match make these startups with the cities. And this brings me to our fourth activity, matchmaking and connection. We connect across all the sectors and across Europe the partners we have in our network, and this way we want to plant the seeds for innovation. So EIT Urban Mobility is the largest innovation community for urban mobility in Europe. There are plenty of players, as you can see here, us, and we are only three years old, but we already work with 300 institutions, with cities, municipalities, industry, research across Europe, and we help them to connect, we help them to share insights, we develop projects with them, we carry through projects with them, and they can learn also about the latest trends in the mobility sector. And one of these trends is, of course, data, mobility data, and data spaces. EIT Urban Mobility is an initiative of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, which is an official body of the European Union. And um, as such, we operate in the entire EU ecosystem. We are part um, of the already mentioned European Green Deal, and we align with other EU programs and policies, such as the new European Bauhaus, the 100 Mission Cities and the Net Zero City program. And we also proactively seek the alignment with our regional and national initiatives, such as the German Mobility Data Space, for example. You will hear about this in a minute. And last but not least, we spur innovation with the creation of expert groups. These expert groups on emerging fields of high interest. And again, we bring the partners together from all the sectors, and we connect them with cities' perspectives and the city's needs. And we define use cases, and then we bring these use cases to different EU programs. We just yesterday kicked off a new expert group on mobility data spaces here in this uh, adjunct to this, uh, this uh, conference. And um, it's on mobility data spaces, and you might wonder what is mobility data space. Some of you are experts here, I know, but others uh, might not be so clear. So we have a, a little video which introduces Daniel again, virtually, <laughs> and then in person. So thank you, and Daniel. En la movilidad urbana, uno de los grandes problemas que tenemos es la compartición de datos. Hay un problema de confianza. Es decir, una empresa no comparte información con otra porque piensa que esos datos van a ser utilizados. Los data spaces son lugares donde definimos cómo vamos a compartir los datos. Una empresa puede compartir datos con otra empresa, pero los datos siempre se quedan dentro de la empresa y siempre hay una trazabilidad total de qué datos se usan y para qué se usan. De tal manera que al final, hasta el usuario final, puede saber qué han pasado con sus datos. Y las empresas pueden saber quién ha utilizado esos datos, porque esos datos han estado acordados a través de una serie de contratos. Entonces, lo que estamos generando con los data spaces son entornos de confianza en donde empresas públicas y privadas compartirán datos. Okay, let me back. Okay. Um, and now coming back to the to the stage. Uh, let me introduce to our our three three panelists. I will start with Michael Schaeffer the director of uh, Mobility Data Space from Germany. 
Welcome, Michael. Hello. Then we have uh, Patrick Blume, the head of portfolio urban mobility at Mercedes Benz. Hello, Patrick. Welcome. And last but not least, Julian Chen, our head of city partnership at EA Urban Mobility. Welcome, Julian. Okay. Um, let's talk about data spaces. Okay. We have a clear goal. I like mean, uh, today is to. Uh, make you understand what is the potential and how we need to unlock the potential of these data spaces. For that reason, I will, I will start directly with one question to each of you. I mean, Mihail, we can start with you. Uh, how do you envision you know, data spaces in 10 years? How this will transform mobility? So I think it's very important to understand at the first place that the data spaces themselves uh, won't provide uh, digital mobility services. Uh, very often that's uh, misunderstood uh, by many actors and, and players, but uh, our credo is, of course, that without data spaces, uh, you will very uh, sh shortly run into limits of providing digital uh, mobility services. Why is that? We are kind of a glue between those who have mobility data available or data that is relevant for mobility and those who need that data in order to provide mobility services. And um, at the same time, I think it's also important to talk about um, the difference between data spaces like the mobility data space and data platforms like uh, data platform provided by Google, by Amazon, by Microsoft and so on. Data spaces, and that's true for all data spaces, provide a sovereign data sharing. What does that mean? You as a data provider have the full control over that, what happens with your data. And now we're talking about urban mobility. And we talk about urban mobility very often and almost always communities are involved. And they have a great issue with providing data to a data lake, to a data platform, because it's public data, it's GDPR relevant. And using a data space, as I have mentioned before, you keep full control over that, what's going to happen with the data. You keep control over the other folks who are using the data. And that is the key nowadays. GDPR <coughs> is a concern, and we are facing that. And in addition to that, a data space is an ecosystem. So it's not only about providing GDPR, safety, security. It's also about forming an ecosystem, forming a community of those who have the data and those who need the data. And by that, we facilitate the introduction and the operation of modern, new, complete, brand new mobility services, finally, um, for good, for the economy, and for the citizens. OK. Thank you, Michael. Now, Patrick, I mean, from, from the Anoyan perspective, how do you see the data spaces? How it will help you, uh, your company, and also I mean, your drivers that we, I mean, will make use of these future data spaces in the future? Mm, yeah. Speaking for an OEM, Mercedes, maybe you know us. Um, we have the car, as a star in front of the car. Um, we are both. We are, on the one hand side, we are consumers of data. Um, we consume a lot of data, and we are producers of data at the same time. Yeah? Um, especially uh, consuming data, particularly for reaching, for example, the different levels of autonomous driving. Um, we would love to see, let's say, and European access point for mobility data. Uh, as you just explained, we need standards, we need a unified um, data standard, we need this in all Europe, we would need this in China as well in the future, maybe one day, and we would need this also, let's say, in the US in one day. Yeah? So um, if we have our customer, he drives cross borders, yeah? he maybe purchases a car for 100,000 euros, and if he drives from France, uh, where you and nearby are, towards Germany, he cannot say, wow, now I have purchased this nice car, but the service is not anymore working. 
in Germany because they have different traffic signs here, different traffic sign catasta. So we need this fully, let's say, seamless service level. On the other side, our car is producing so much data. We have, let's say, 300, 400 sensors in the car. And in the future, what our aim is to provide even more data than we do today already to those data spaces. With Michael, we already work on this. With the mobility data space in Germany, we share already a lot of data to those um, data spaces. Um, we will do that in the future even more because the cars get smarter even more and more. But um, we have one challenge to take. That's data protection. Okay. Our customers need to have the trust in Mercedes to say, hey, yes, I give you my consent to use the data for mobility data spaces. Without data protection and clear trust in our cars, in our brand, but also in the mobility data spaces, there won't be any data sharing at all. And without data, there are no data spaces, right? So that's uh, a bit the role we are having. So on the one hand side, we're consuming a lot of data uh, and would love to have this European-wide, maybe one day in China, one day in, in the US. But on the other side, we love to provide even more data in 10 years to the mobility data spaces. OK, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I mean, we will come back to this point of, you know, of, of trust, OK? Of, and that's very important for Europe, I mean. And, and this is what basically what differentiates data spaces, OK? Because it has born in Europe, and it's, we are creating our own standards. But now, let's go to Julian, OK? Julian, um, from just this perspective that you have for the European cities, how do you think that the data spaces could help cities to transform their mobility? and got this mission of decarbonization. Yeah, absolutely. So as my colleague Judith was mentioning, at EIT Urban Mobility, a real core function that we have is thinking about how do we bring together cities and companies and research, research institutes to work together to co-develop and test and pilot and demonstrate and evaluate innovation projects that are going to help us meet a more sustainable urban mobility future. Uh, and so, as part of that work, I get to talk to lots of different cities, and it turns out that even though there are very, very diverse types of cities in, in the EU, they all come back to a lot of very similar fundamental needs. They're looking at how do you reduce emissions, how do you increase uh, public transportation usage, how do you uh, increase the number of people who are using active mobility modes. They have a lot of very common needs, and so we can start taking those common needs and start thinking about how do we steer those in directions that, that make sense. Uh, how do we start to compile, organize, convene, so that we can start having deeper conversations about creating these data spaces that lots of different people can use, so that not every single city has to reinvent the wheel over and over over again. And at the end of the day, I think that's how we truly make progress. OK, thank you, Julian. Now, let me come back to Michael, because, I mean, you are our reference on mobility data space, on data spaces in, in Europe. And, and you have been developing many use cases, OK? Maybe uh, uh, could you give us some examples of some use cases that you have already implemented? I mean, if it's in collaboration with, with Patrick, it could be great. But uh, it's just to uh, explain to the audience what is the possibilities that data space will bring to a uh, mobility sector. Absolutely. And it's, it's even a use case I'm having in my mind where Patrick or Patrick's company is involved. Let me start with asking you, who is driving an electrical vehicle? Not so many. All right. Okay. So many. Okay. <laughs> Those who are not actually driving or owning an electrical vehicle, who is thinking about owning or driving an electrical vehicle? Okay. All right. Okay. So what we have seen in the past is that is a great concern owning or driving an electrical vehicle because people are concerned about recharging, refueling the battery, right? And why is that? That is because of the charging infrastructure. And we not, we, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. It's a feeling. It's a concern. So this concern leads to the effect that the esteemed gentleman right next to me is not able to sell more electrical cars. OK, so it's a problem for the economy. Next one, if we believe, and that is what we all do, right? We are strong believers of, of the change of mobility, of sustainability. So we want to move, we want to change 
to electrical mobility as quickly as possible. And in order to do so, we must, yeah, we must fight against that concern not being able to refuel the battery of the car. And that is only possible if we yeah, improve the charging infrastructure. The charging infrastructure is poor because of the poor data quality. And that is the reason why we badly need data spaces. Where does the data come from that is part of the charging infrastructure? It comes from the automotive industry. It comes from electricity providers, from utilities companies. It come from, comes from grid providers. And last but not least, and very, very important, comes from communities, from cities. And that is why we are here, right? And that is also one of the very good reasons, and if so, the only good reason for cities to join a data space. So we have several data sources in order to improve something. And only if all those companies and all those parties together, work together, share the data, you can improve the situation. So actually, what we are doing is to run a working group with the OEMs, with cities, with, elect with util utility companies and grid providers to yeah, to deal with that concern, improving data quality of the charging infrastructure, and we're going to get there. Okay, excellent example. I mean, that uh, all of the ones that we have drive uh, electric vehicle, we face this problem, you know, of availability of chargers. But from the OEM perspective, Patrick, um, you mentioned before, you know, the interoperability. I mean, you are your cars. You are driving all over the world, and also you see that every city is different sometimes when you want to connect to the operating system of the city, okay? How do you face this challenge today, and how data spaces could help to have, you know, an European standard that help us to share information across Europe? Today, we do a lot on our own, to be honest, yeah? Um, I think that's not the right way, to be honest, but uh, today, when you speak about traffic signs, um, we try to collect them on our own, we use our cameras. Um, but of course, you also know there are mistakes by the car. Sometimes it recognizes the 70 kilometer as a 50 or the other way around. That's why I get at least my speeding tickets. But um, that's a problem, especially when you come towards autonomous driving, of course. Or is the road slippery ahead? Yeah, We want uh, to know that, to, to warn the driver, hey, there's a slippery road ahead. Mm -hmm. So what we would need is um, at least um, um, uh, same data formats, uh, consistency in data, um, and, and that should be on a European level. Because coming back to what I said is, um, we as an OEM, we think in three, four markets, China, US, Europe, maybe in the future India, and that would be um, yeah, a great help to achieve um, the future of urban mobility if we have in the first place, standards, um, where everybody can provide their data to. Second is we need trust. Mm -hmm. uh, we need a, a trusted a data place, a trusted partner. So the thing is, we need to collaborate. It's not, it could not be the case that the Autobahn, for example, is doing something different than the Land Baden-Württemberg. Uh, they need to collaborate, and we also need to collaborate with the counties and the, and the cities and whatsoever. So for us as an OEM, it's very new at the moment to partner with the city, to be honest. Currently, we're partnering with the Netherlands as a road operator, but we need this. And the last point, which is for me most important, is we need to create shared value. So only sharing data in a, in a data space makes sense if everyone can participate from it, if everyone can draw their own conclusions, their own business cases from it. It doesn't need to be monetary. We have been discussing this upfront. It can be of social value. It can be of environmental value. But in the end, having data only for the sake of data doesn't make much sense. I see that a lot. A lot of cities ask for data. Can we have more car data? And then we give them data, but they don't know what to do with the data, actually. Yeah? So you really need to have use cases. And only if you have use cases, people are willing to share the data. Hmm. And other, the other challenge that I mean we uh, we see on cities is the uh, the skills that you know the people that you used to talk you know you need to dial you dialogue with many many cities, and I would to ask to Julian okay mm -hmm. what do you think that uh, what kind of skills are needed 
already in cities, to be able just to have this knowledge of data on the data spaces? Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. And I might even broaden it beyond skills and talk about the need to build a culture of data within government. So right, first we start with the culture, and then we think about what is the right set of skills that we need. Uh, but that people really understand that data is important within government, that civil servants understand that it's not just a trend, that it's actually driving decision making, that there's commitment from the top, that there's budget, that it's not a one-off that's going to disappear when someone changes their mind. Um, so for me, it's very much about that culture, that people really believe in it. And I think we all know here that building cultures and changing cultures is difficult, uh, right? If we think about all of the organizations that we work in, even, even the data forward ones, you can imagine in your organization what it would take to go to the next step in a data culture. And then think about that in the context of a very complex civil society. So it's something that where we really have to be in for the long haul uh, and show a long-term commitment. But the good news, right, there's a lot of interesting things happening as well. So uh, the city of Baltimore has set up a data academy that they can use to train all of their civil servants. And we start seeing more and more within cities that they have job titles like chief data officers. <laughs> um, when I was in the city of Los Angeles in 2015, we hired our first data scientist who was very much focused on social issues. And for me, that's really important, that we have people not only with the technical skills, but people with the technical skills and can translate and communicate that into things that right people uh, can understand uh, and make citizens really care about what's happening. So I think that ties a little bit right into the question of, of citizen engagement, which we, we talk a lot about which is that if we want citizens to care about data and then to show the politicians that they care about data and that they should invest in data, we also need to think about how do we turn data into stories that people care about. So yeah. where are the electric charging stations? Uh, are public transport uh, systems on time or not? Uh, what happens with low emission zones? And what is the impact on air pollution and noise pollu pollution and quality of life? And so I think really at the end of the day, we can do a much better job of thinking about how we tell the stories and turn those stories into things that people care about. And that's also how we drive the culture and then the skills. Yeah, I think we need to put the, the citizen or the user in the equation okay, of data spaces. I would, I would like to add to this, if you don't mind. So if you would ask me what I think are the skills necessary for, let's say, the, the public administration folks in the cities, mm -hmm. I think at the first place they should know about the burden and the concerns and the needs of their people, of the people who are coming for tourism and for work and for business. That is what they should focus on. And they should think that to the end. And we say they think that to the end is this all about digitization, right? So nowadays, if you want to get something sorted, it's about digitization. And for digitization, you need data. Here we go. Then we have... The OEMs, they are experts about how to digitize cars and how to work on the data, how to refine the data, how to deal with the data in a secure and safe manner. And then we have the data spaces. Our business is data. So I would say, or I would not expect cities to be experts in data. I would expect them to be experts of the needs of the people. So I think that is very important. And then think it to the end. And then tie the right parties together, as you have mentioned before, to get that sorted. I think that's very important. So you have to go the next step. But you also need, as you said, a transformation. I, can, I always like to give concrete examples, because that makes it easy. Um, we have a nice product based on our assistance system data. So we can predict where the next crash is going to be happening. Uh, based on our assistance systems, the car is braking. Uh, we can say it was braking because there was a pedestrian on the road. And we can give this data to cities. Uh, so cities can prevent the next crash to reach vision zero. That's all, all our goal, yeah? Uh, zero fatalities and traffic. Um, the data is available. We could also share it through mobility data spaces. But in the end, the question is, what is the city doing with the data? And you know what the cities tell me? Well, your data is nice, but the politics says, I can only become active if somebody is dying in traffic. I only get the budget if somebody is dying. So your data is nice, and it would help me to make actually data-driven decision-making. 
but I don't have the budget, I don't have the policies in hand uh, to do that. So again, at the end, it's about shared value. We would love to deliver more of such data, but if in the end no one is using this data for their value creation, mm -hmm. then it's useless. Okay, and, and oh. that's a, good, a, a very good example, because I think also it's important that, you know, the private sector and the public sector of the city, they align on one mission, okay? Because, I mean, you will understand each other and you work together with one mission, okay? Right now, we, we know that in Europe, we face the problem of climate change, we want to decarbonize cities, and how do you think that, you know, data spaces could help, you know, to work together with the mission of decarbonization, for example? Yeah. First of all, I have to admit, we, we, we know, finally, we know that we are part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but we now want to be part of the solution. Okay. And um, one of the biggest contributors we have been identifying when we have been talking to cities is actually the sharing of data. They are interested in data maybe on charging to make the charging more ease, uh, to convince more people to use the e-vehicle, maybe on road safety. Um, so we are very convinced at Mercedes that we can be part of the solution but it forces us on the one hand side to share data into those data places, but also it forces us to collaborate. We have totally new collaborations with Transport for London. Uh, I have never thought that Mercedes is going to partner with a city like Transport for London uh, to work on data. That's new for us. Uh, Michael, I want to... Oh, first, I mean, you, well, you can... Why are you just doing that with London? That doesn't scale up. <laughs> Sure. You should deliver the data into the data space, then it scales. No, seriously. You made a very important point, I think. So, the data is there in some. There is private data or data under the hood of, of companies. The cities have data and other uh, public uh, bodies have, have data. Um, the problem is, actually, they're not sharing that enough. So, what we are doing is, in a couple of weeks' time, we will have the data of the German National Access Point, the Mobilität, connected to the mobility data space, enabling customers of the mobility data space to take profit from both private data and public data in order to improve quality and service level of their digital services. And I think that is key in digital or in data economy. It's not about preventing stuff you own from others anymore, where you take full profit only if you share it. Because, you know, data is not consumed like people say it's the oil of the, the digital age. It's not the oil, because oil is consumed and then it's gone. <laughs> data will never be consumed completely. And that is key and that is something we, we have to be aware of. We have to deal with data in a completely different manner than we did with other sources before. Mm. Michal, yeah, yes, coming to, to, to this point, you know, that you, I mean, you are already creating, you know, the, the bridge to get information from, from this national access point to, the, to other companies. But just the case of one company, I would say public company, that they say, why I need to share data? Uh, what is the trust that I have if I give you my data. What do you will say that the mobility data space will offer to them? All right. Um, so I would like to follow up answering that question with that uh, example I in introduced before, uh, charging infrastructure. So uh, if we are believers of the move to electrical uh, mobility, um, and then it's a great opportunity for cities, communalities, by positioning charging points at a certain location in the cities, controlling traffic. So very often you hear cities want to get the traffic out of the city centers. Fair enough. How do you do that? By putting the charging stations out of the city center, because that is where the people will drive to, right? And then, of course, that needs to be added by further public transport services. So clever digital services, for instance, those who are approaching um, a charging station that is not immediately located in the city center, but then using it, for instance, get the public transport for free from there to the city center. 
Just an example, as I've mentioned before, we are not providing the services. The mobility data space or any data space would provide the management of the data, would provide the ecosystem, the networking be between or amongst the partners, the parties that are involved in such a service. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, Julian, um, coming back to, you know, to, to the city's needs, okay? Mm -hmm. we, we have seen that, you know, how, how important is the data for planning the future cities. I mean, the data will require a lot of cities for the private and the public sector. We have seen how, you know, the e-scooters emerge in our cities, you know, and how important it is to improve, you know, the mobility. How do you think that uh, the cities will need data to improve, you know, uh, their mission to decarbonization? Well, we hear every day that they, that they need data. Um, and I think it goes a little bit back to what we were talking about earlier about the culture and the skills to actually then think about how do you communicate those needs in a way. And then once you have that data, how do you use it in a way that really makes sense? And I think that's maybe where I might build off of what you were saying, which is that cities don't need to be the experts in, in data. That may be true in some instances, but I still think that cities need to have enough expertise where they're still leading the conversation. Because if, right, we're going back to the cities need to know what their needs are, and they need to be able to use those needs to then drive the conversation on what's really happening, what's needed, and how do we use that to support a more sustainable, inclusive society. So I think it's very much about how we support cities to demonstrate that leadership, how they have the common vocabulary where they can have those real conversations, and then go back to how they then turn those uh, data points again into, into stories that matter. Okay. Um, Patrick, um, coming back to the data that, that, that you are producing today, you know, in your cars, uh, you have also the need to use data for other providers in your cars? Can you rephrase again? I mean, that's, uh, you, you are producing data, you know? Yes. Uh, but you also have the need to integrate data for other providers. Totally, in your yeah. I mean, like in every day, in every, uh, we integrate data from the um, grid providers, from the, from the charging station providers. We integrate uh, map data okay. for autonomous driving. And that's the point uh, uh, where we made, like, this integration of the car requires a tremendous effort. And that's why we, in some cases, say it's better for us to collect this data on our own. Some data we can't. But uh, if we collaborate uh, on a European level, for example, um, that would be much easier, for example, for us to reach the next level of autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. OK, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Michal, I mean, um, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, I mean, in the mobility sector, you know, how uh, the mobility as a service will solve all the problems for the mobility because we see that uh, it will provide this uh, interoperability, you know, multimodality. But at the end, uh, today we are having today hundreds of apps in our mobile, you know, to connect to one mobility services, you know. How do you think that, you know, mobility services could help, for example, a user to move from France to Germany, I mean, you are in close to the border, without, you know, trying to download different apps or mobility services. So right now, where we stand right now in 2023, I would say we are kind of the wild west of data spaces and also mobility as a service. It's, it's really like, you know, maybe some of you are old enough to remember when the internet was invented in the early 90s where you have, have to, had to, to think about, okay, this is the web page of XYZ, and you have to use Netscape Navigator, and for that you had to use Internet Explorer. Do you care about the browser any, uh, right now? No, you don't. Maybe you have a favorite, but it actually doesn't matter. All browsers are working with all web, space, uh, web pages. And that is true for that where we are in terms of data spaces, in terms of mobility as a service. And it's right to do so. We are going ahead and developing, and we are setting our claims, and it will take a couple of years, and then it will all collect it back, and it's going to get harmonized. And I tell you, in 10 years, we don't have that discussion anymore. Data space, from a technical perspective, are then commodity. They're just there. When you know it days, you fire up your browser, 
you provide a URL. Do you think about what's going on in the background? No. DNS? What the hell is DNS? Proxy server? <laughs> I don't care. It's just working. That's the case in 10 years' time with data spaces. We even do not care about who is going to pay for that. Somebody is paying for that, yes. But before we get there, we have to develop and to go in all possible directions in order to find out what's the right way to go. We, we, we can't afford to wait until everything is going to get harmonized. We have to move forward. People who do not follow that will have a great disadvantage in the future, seriously. Okay, I mean, it's great in this conversation that today we are not talking about technology, okay? And data spaces is basically it's a platform, it's a technology, but it's good that we are talking about, you know, about the possibilities, you know, the challenge that we have, you know? And I, will, I, will, I want to talk, you know, about something that I will say that is our human superpower, that is collaboration, you know? And how do you see that, you know, we need to collaborate, you know, across different countries, different sectors, in the mobility in order to unlock the potential of data spaces. Because we, as you say before, we are in an early stage, okay? We have a long way to go, okay? But what kind of collaboration do you think is needed uh, across Europe to, to go make this goal of implementing the European mobility data spaces? Um, yeah, I can try to, to take a crack, um, but in, I'll bring it back to cities in a way, because I think yesterday we were having a very nice conversation about how it's challenging to define the business case for, let's say, cities to buy this type of data. And one of the things that we were talking about is it's not even collaboration across EU, it's collaboration across departments within a city. <laughs> so maybe you can convince right, uh, one department that they need a certain type of data, but then there's actually 10 other departments that also would like to have that data just for very different reasons. So if you're looking at pedestrian data, that's, you know, that's police, that's fire, that's safety, that's sustainability, that's mobility. There's all these different departments. And I think one of the challenges is that a lot of them are still using a lot of legacy data data systems that don't even speak to each other internally. And so I think right, that's, there's a big conversation, but there's also a very local conversation about how we're collecting and storing data and collaborating across departments. Um, and I, I do have some optimism that this conversation around data spaces and really showing the potential of what's possible uh, can move that conversation forward. It's so true what you're just mentioning. So sometimes it's, I don't know whether I should call it funny or awkward. But sometimes you have the feeling it's easier to get from Germany to France than from Cologne to Düsseldorf. <laughs> Maybe they introduce border control between Cologne and Düsseldorf. I have no idea. They better should. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, it's right. So what's true for the big is true for the small. So right now we have so many communities located right next to each other and they do not exchange data, but they should. And that is the reason why I said, okay, at the first place, you should know about the burden of your people, but you're right, then you have to follow up with that. But that is exactly uh, why data spaces are, that, let's say, the answer to those issues between it's easy to use them, it's transparent, and you keep control and sovereignty about that, what's going on with your data. I think that's very important and that's a great concern, particularly for public administration. Patrick? I really love to question what you say, what, what are you dreaming of or what are you wishing uh, for in the next 10 years? Uh, I, as I said, I love to speak in intangible solutions. So we had a great project with the IT, uh, with the city of Helsinki in Amsterdam and uh, where we wanted um, to warn our drivers when they're approaching a school zone. We asked them, hey, please slow down, there's a school zone ahead. And um, then we got the chance to scale this across Europe. And Mercedes said, that's so nice, it's such a value add for our drivers to warn them that there's a school zone ahead. Um, let's do this, large scale. Uh, but we couldn't do that because um, we didn't find uh, all the school zones available by the cities. Uh, when you go to Helsinki, they have them in this data format. Amsterdam has them in this data format. Cologne has just uh, the, the, the Nippes school zones. Yeah, and it's so, so fragmented. And my dream would be in 10 years that we have a European data space that helps us as an OAM together with you to reach Vision Zero. 
for example, by warning everyone who is approaching a school zone, because that's our future we want to save. Yeah? And I'm saying that because I have been involved myself in a, in a car crash, and I, I think that's the shared value we, we can produce together. Yeah? Okay, excellent. And, and Julian, I mean, you are also as an expert of citizen engagement, you know. How do you see that we, we need to involve at the end the citizen? The citizens need to, I mean, they need to know that, you know, an OEM is sharing data with the city, or what they are expecting at the end? What is the value that they will get from all these data spaces? Well, I think that's where the, the question of the, the shared value comes in. Um, so that's, I think there, there is common ground that we can find around helping citizens understand where this makes sense, but also where it doesn't make sense. And I think that's very important that we don't have this conversation without talking about equity. Um, as a social scientist, as an urban planner, I think it's also very important that there are people also thinking about, okay, how are we using this data? What is it for? Is it exacerbating bias? Is it really advancing our goals as, as a city and providing equitable city services? And so I I think that's really important as well. Um, and you know, there's a, a saying that, that is going around right now, which is that change moves at the speed of trust. And it's not just companies trusting other companies or companies trusting cities, but it's also about cities or citizens trusting cities uh, and, and companies. And I, I don't think that happens overnight either. Okay, okay. I mean, at the end, it's a long way. I mean, all together we are working and with many uh, European stakeholders in order to implement these uh, future mm -hmm. uh, data spaces. In fact, I mean, uh, we are already, most of the organization, we are working in this preparatory for data spaces that is the European initiative that will prepare the floor for the European mobility data spaces and will be one of the first together with the health mobility data spaces that will be created in Europe. But now, uh, before we finish, I want to, you know, ask the, our, you know, our audience, if you have questions to our, uh, our panelists, do you have any questions? Because I think there's someone with a micro. Please raise your hands yeah. and... Hello, Frank Wisseling, Deutsche Telekom. I uh, bin the exec from Big Data AI and Data Spaces. I have an, I've, I've got a question to you uh, concerning you're always talking about data. Data needs to be interpreted. And the analytics is mostly cre creating the value. Do you envisage in your process also analytics process so that you get results for the community they can use from the onset? I can, I can start answering that. Um, so I, earlier before, I, I talked about the, the ecosystem uh, that is one of the products of a data space, no? forming an ecosystem. And part of that ecosystem are actually are four parties. One is the, the data space itself, the, the facilitator or the operator, if you like. Uh, the second one are data providers, and the th third one, the data consumers, the actors. And the fourth one are service providers. And uh, those service providers are exactly doing that, what you just mentioned before. It, it, it could be AI-based, whatever it is. It, it, it doesn't matter. So service providers who are actually consuming data, refining it, doing something valuable with it, and provide it again to other parties who are using that. That's part of the concept of data spaces. So forgive me uh, introducing the European Data Act. It's quite complicated, but if you look into that, it's very important. They describe what a data space is about and that what you just mentioned before is part of that. And if I may add, uh, because you concretely asked for anal analytics, um, what we already do today is that we as an OEM, we don't provide raw data to the mobility data spaces. We already analyze the data, for example, when you speak about weather data, uh, or about charging data or hazard warnings, we do a first analysis because we, in the first place, don't want to share our data due to the fact of data protection. That's very crucial for us. Um, and on the other side, um, we think that as an OAM, we best understand uh, acceleration, a deacceleration, a wiper status. And in the end, uh, people are only going to work with the data if they can understand it. And that's why we are convinced 
we're not sharing raw data into those mobility data spaces, but already to a certain degree analyze data so that you get the most out of it. OK. Any other question? No questions? OK, then I will, I will finalize with one question to you, OK? Yeah? Um, I would you, very brief, OK? What will be your personal contribution, you know, uh, for, for, the, for the data spaces in Europe? Your personal contribution, you know? Yeah, I mean, you are representing a company, but... My personal contribution today is once we're finished with that, I will be here for you. You can come to me and we can talk about your participation with the mobility data space. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, my personal contribution in 10 years, what I would be wishing for, don't nail me down if that's going to happen, but 10 years, CES, Las Vegas, uh, we are not uh, showing the newest Mercedes-Benz uh, or the newest feature but we're showing a big collaboration in a mobility data space with a concrete use case together with the city of Cologne. Yeah, that would be what I would be personally fighting for. Okay, excellent. And Julian? Oh, I, I think that's a, that's a tough one to look 10 years out. Um, <laughs> but I do feel like I've been a little pessimistic today, so I'll try to end on an optimistic note, which is in 10 years, I, I do see a future where cities, let's say, no matter their size, can have the data that they need, feel like they can make data-driven decisions in the ways that make sense, and that my personal contribution would be to help facilitate those discussions, to bring people together, to, to think about how we can achieve that together. Um, and if, if I can play some role in that, I would be very happy. Okay, excellent. Yeah. I would say my personal contribution, you know, and how I envision this, this, this transformation. I, I think the, the first thing I, I will push for for really collaboration. I mean, that's, uh, we need to go to the next level of the collaboration because on the early, this early stage, okay, when we start using data, we have seen that, okay, that's good, but I will not share my data and I will push for uh, the next level. And my, my, my dream is that, I mean, we, we make Europe stronger, okay? We, are, we, are, we have good connection system. I mean, that's, uh, the cities are not so far. Uh, the countries are closer to each other. And we really need to, to have an a, a operative system in Europe that help us to connect you know, all the cities in Europe. Because I think we need to, at the end, to try to decarbonize, you know, to fight this climate change. And I hope that in 10 years we can be all together here and just talking about success okay, of the data spaces. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you, Mara, for the panelists. You were great and you were helping me so much to make the audience understand what is the potential of the data spaces. Thank you and we will be here if you want to have any other questions. <laughs>